when I tell people that I study bees and pollination, I almost always get the same response. Some variation on, isn't it terrible that the bees are dying? Why do I feel, why do I cringe when I hear these statements? When I see posts on the internet that say things like, scientists predict a lack of bees will lead to a food crisis. Aren't I one of those scientists? The best way to explain my unease is to start by showing you one of the most extreme examples of the story that I've seen. This was a letter to the Gisborne Herald last year. If the bees were to disappear, we would only have a few years to live. After the bees had gone, the first year we'd eat the crops. The second year, the seed reserves. In the third year, we'd eat the animals that would be left, and the fourth year, each other. <laughs> That's reality. In this room, reality, we have just four short years between bee deaths and a cannibalistic apocalypse. <laughs> Although it's over the top, I do, this does have a lot of features in common with many of the stories I hear every day. And I want to start by picking out one of the features. The phrase, the bees. We're constantly hearing that the bees are dying. Here are some bees. This is 1,000 species of bees written in a font small enough that I can cram them onto one slide. But this isn't all the bees. In actual fact, there could be up to 25,000 species of bees in the world. There are numerous species of bumblebees, mason bees, orchid bees, sweat bees. The list goes on. Which one of these bees was the author referring to? <laughs> this group of bees as, as a whole are very important pollinators all over the world. They've evolved special relationships with flowering plants for over 100 million years. If we lost all of this, we would be in trouble. But I don't think anyone is arguing that that's going to happen. However, it's important to note that when scientists talk about bees being in trouble, they're actually thinking of bees in this wider context. But I don't think the letter writer was thinking about these 25,000 species. I think they were thinking about honeybees. But there's actually seven honeybee species, and this is just four of them. Again, this is too broad. When people read and retweet the news about bee deaths, I think they're just thinking about one species out of 25,000, the European honeybee. The European honeybee is undoubtedly the most important crop pollinator around the world. It's the only pollinator we can bring in vast numbers easily into fields for pollination. <clears throat> but there's plenty of other species out there. In the same fields that we bring in these vast numbers of bees for pollination, there are a whole range of other animals that visit flowers, and sometimes these can be important pollinators. Here are just a few of the insects that we find visiting avocado and kiwifruit flowers right here in the Bay of Plenty, including native bees, beetles, and flies. In fact, pollination is very rarely due to the work of a single pollinator species, and it takes a detailed, systematic study to untangle the relative contributions of these different species. My interest in pollination began 13 years ago on a research trip to Moto Ohora, or Whale Island, just off the coast of Fakatane. We were there to study saddlebacks in Tuatara. But on the first evening, I wandered down to the beach after sunset and found on the early Purukawa bloom hundreds of geckos feeding on the flowers and drinking the nectar. That first night, we counted over 200 geckos on a meter square patch of flower. On this pest-free island, it's known for its amazing gecko populations, but it left me wondering, was this sight of geckos draped over flowers, did that used to occur everywhere? <coughs> New Zealand is one of the few locations where we can actually study the long-term effects of losing pollinators. We've lost most of our bird, bat, and gecko pollinators across much of the north of the North Island, but in offshore island reserves, we can step back in time and see how these forests once used to operate. We can do a before and after study. I ended up studying Puhutakawa and other flowers for my PhD. And with the bright red flowers and lots of nectar, it's a classic example of a bird pollinated tree, or so we thought. Hoturu, Little Barrier Island, is one of the last locations left where we have all our populations of bird, bat, and gecko pollinators. I used a series of uh, video systems to count how many animals visited flowers, and birds certainly turned up in my videos. But at the end of the day, when these birds went to bed, 
a completely different picture emerged. Short-tailed bats, a unique New Zealand bat species, was visiting these flowers in unbelievable numbers. The whole canopy of the trees was shaking with the force of hundreds of these bats ricocheting off flowers. Where during the day I would spend hours between subsequent bird visits, at night each cluster of flowers had over 40 bat visits per hour. And I was able to find out through exclusion experiments that it was in fact these bats that were pollinating Puhutukawa, not the more visible birds during the day. I also went on to find that these bats were visiting other species, including nikau palms, hebes, and the New Zealand honeysuckle tree, rail rail. It was a powerful demonstration of the fact that often the true story of pollination is quite different to what it first seems. In fact, uh, and of course, the next question that we all have is, with the loss of these birds and bats, what has been the consequences for pollination? At my field sites around Auckland, I found that some species, including Putukawa, produce much fewer seeds uh, in the absence of their pollinators than on Little Barrier. Here's another example. This is a beautiful native flower, Toropapa, that few people know. It has long tube-like flowers that require birds for pollination, birds that no longer occur across much of the forest where it lives. As a result, very few fruit are produced, and the fruit that are produced have just one-tenth of the number of seeds that we find on Little Barrier Island. This is a classic syndrome of pollination failure. But for some species, pollination wasn't that bad. In fact, pollination was much better than I would have expected given the loss of the pollinators. And here's part of the reason. The invasive shipwreck, one of the major causes of bird extinctions, was now visiting these flowers, crawling all over them, and drinking the nectar. They were crawling over them in much the same way that the rats used to do. And this is a really important bit. Flowers produce great rewards for animals who choose to visit them. And it doesn't really matter who visits, so long as they pollinate. In fact, the pollination that occurs around us in gardens and orchards and forests is often driven by really weird assemblages of species from all over the world. Weeds are pollinated by native bees. Native flowers are pollinated by introduced bees. And the pollination that produces our crops depends on these uh, unusual interactions, human-created interactions from species all over the world. Take avocado, for example. This is a Central American flower being pollinated by a European bee down here on an island in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Crop pollination by honeybees is not a natural system. It's an artificial, human-created one. So if it's an artificial system, what would happen if we lost the honeybees? This is a really important question that is incredibly difficult to answer. And I'm going to get to it. But first of all, we need to look at the claim that we're losing the honeybee. Honeybees today face unparalleled threats, without a doubt. The varroa mite, the little brown dot on the bottom of the bee there, has now spread across the globe with its associated diseases, and honeybee hives now will not survive without human intervention. The environments that honeybees live in give them incredible challenges, including the loss of flowering plants and pesticides. Then there's colony collapse disorder, a, syn a syndrome where we see bee co colonies just completely disappearing in a very short space of time, and we still don't understand the cause. The end result of all these threats is an unparalleled rise in the hive loss rates. In the latest report from the United States last year, they experienced 42% hive loss rate. 42% of hives were lost last year. No wonder people fear that we're going to lose bees in just a few years. But when we hear these studies, we, there's something really important we need to keep in mind. Theoretically, beekeepers can double their hives every year. They take a colony, split it in two, and put new bees in. One colony becomes two, or even more. So when we look at the, what are the effects are of hive loss rates, we need to consider long-term trends in hive numbers. This chart shows the numbers of honeybee hives in the United States going back to 1999. Well, there was a dip down just after colony collapse disorder emerged in 2006, 
Overall, in the last 10 years, we've seen an increase in hive numbers in the United States, despite these unparalleled threats. Now, we don't know what would have happened if we didn't have these high hive loss rates. But this certainly isn't the trajectory of a species that, that's about to disappear. Here in New Zealand, our best guess is that hive loss rates are less than half of what we see in the States currently. However, last year we started to see the first symptoms of what looks an awful lot like colony collapse disorder. In the last 10 years in New Zealand, our hive numbers have increased by two-thirds, growing from 300,000 to 500,000. We have a different driver of hive numbers here in New Zealand. Our unique Monica honey has special antibacterial activity, and global demand for this honey has driven these hive rises. It's important to note, though, bees die, colonies disappear, but hive numbers are increasing. But we can't get complacent about these hive rises. We can't get complacent about the future of honeybees. These charts actually show the resilience and hard work of the beekeeping industry. And with emerging new threats, it's actually imperative that we get new tools for growers to keep those hives alive. Based on what we've seen in the past, I don't think we'll let these bees go extinct. We're not going to let them disappear. But to keep hive numbers increasing in the face of 40% annual hive losses takes a lot of hard work, and hard work costs money. I would argue that the true threat to crop pollination is the increase in the cost of keeping bees alive. Growers pay for bees to be brought into their orchards for pollination, and the cost of renting those hives has steeply increased in recent years. If we continue to see these increases, it could be that the cost of some produce items that you buy become unaffordable. We could lose choice in the, in the produce that we buy. But before that happens, my guess is that some growers would risk not bringing hives in because they simply cost too much. So now we're back to that question, that tricky question. What would happen if we didn't bring hives in for pollination? It's an experiment that very few people are willing to try. In my PhD, I found that following the loss of pollinators, some plants did suffer. But other plants did all right, because other pollinators were able to do the job. We have to remember that there are many species out there that visit flowers for nectar and pollen. If we didn't have honeybees brought in in large numbers to our orchards, there'd be a lot more nectar and pollen to go around. Who knows if those other species could do the job, drawn in by these newly available resources. But what we do know is that these other pollinators face significant obstacles. While honeybees are brought in, in and out of fields as needed, the, uh, these other pollinators live out their lives on farms. And so they're more vulnerable to farming practices such as pesticide use and loss of habitat. In fact, studies that, we ha we, that have been conducted show that in actual fact, it is these other bees, wild bees, including bumblebees and other pollinators, that truly are in decline. In a future where we might have to reduce our reliance on honeybees due to the increasing costs, we need to know how to look after these other species. In our research, we're putting a lot of emphasis on these other species. Although we don't know where the bumblebee populations are in decline in New Zealand, we're working on technologies to allow growers to look after these colonies in their orchards. We're also looking to identify what other pollinators make a big contribution, and then we'll boost their numbers. I believe that if we start to shift our focus towards nurturing a diversity of other pollinators, we'll see improved pollination and a more secure and more sustainable production of food. Honeybees will always remain the backbone, and so we need to look after them, invest in protecting them from the new threats they face. But if there is one message you take from this talk today, it should be that nature rarely uses just one species for pollination, and neither should we. Thank you.